Dave, thanks very much for chatting to me. You've Your book has just come out, The Penguin Book of South African Sports Trivia. Correct. Uh, a lot of in-depth uh, information, sports trivia, but not your usual statistics and who scored what goal. It's a bit of a twist. How did the, the idea for the book come about? Well, Penguin approached Kevin McCallum and I uh, to write a, a, a sports trivia book. And I think initially they did want something along the lines of who won the Curry Cup in 1966 and named all the Durban July winners and things like that. And so when we sat down with them, we said, we would actually like to tell stories and we'd like to look for quirky things. So, um, for example, I, I, I work with Peter Hendricks, the Springbok winger, and he had told me a while ago that um, the try that he scored against uh, Australia in the opening match of the World Cup in 95 shouldn't have been allowed because he'd never dotted the ball down. And, and so I thought, well, in fact, that was the first question I wrote up for the book. Um, it, so it was things like that, things that people were familiar with but probably didn't know the background to. So we, mm. we researched along those lines and we phoned up mates of ours who were sportsmen and we'd say, the simple question was, tell us something about yourself nobody knows. So, for example, Bruce Fordyce um, said, what do my 1985 and 1987 uprun wins have in common? And the answer is he did them in exactly the same time. Hours, minutes, and seconds, exactly the same. And he reckons he's the only runner to have two identical times. And the thing about it is they're both victorious times. Mm -hmm. So th that's how we, we got a lot of the stuff. Uh, so it was really looking for the quirky angles on, on sports stories and stories behind stories. Now, a lot of, you mentioned the quirky side of the sports stories. Um, a lot of the stuff you won't find in archives, you won't find them in library books or on, on, on the internet. How long did it take you? Because a lot of the answers are in depth. Yeah, it's trawling around. Uh, I must say, Sheldon, a lot of the stuff, the easiest thing was to just go to the people who were there and, and say, tell me how it happened. But uh, there is an amazing amount of material that is available on the Internet. The thing about it, though, is you, you can never rely on one source. And Wikipedia is one you must never, ever rely on. It's, uh, I, I'd, I think 90 percent of the time it was wrong. Um, and I've got over the years, I've built up a collection of sports books. I don't collect them because I'm sports mad or anything I just I'm always because I was always doing sports journalism I was always given them so they, they were stuck away so I was able to look at those as references and when I found that a whole series of books would corroborate something I'd use it but there was one uh, I'll give you an example of trawling around um, a question that I really enjoyed uh, that we got asked once on our sports talk show was why is Madonna the singer Madonna why is she responsible for Gary Kirsten's cricketing career his international career. And the answer is this, that uh, the South Africans were in Australia and they played a match at the Melbourne Cricket Ground and Brian McMillan twisted his ankle and he was out of action for the early part of the tour. So they flew Gary Kirsten in as cover but immediately put him in the first one day international in the first test mm -hmm. match and he went on to play well over 100 test matches for South Africa. But that was his break. It was um, because the field was so churned up by a Madonna concert or a series of Madonna concerts at the Melbourne Cricket Ground five days prior to this, this match um, that the, this uneven surface resulted in Brian McMillan getting injured. So, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but it, I mean, that's what the book's yeah. for, you know. To, so if Madonna's concert hadn't been there, the ground wouldn't have been rough. Brian McMillan wouldn't have twisted his ankle. Gary Kirsten wouldn't have been flown out. Who knows what would have happened? We would never have had one of our best opening batsmen. That's right. Now, the thing was to find out the details of him twisting his ankle, and I couldn't get hold of Brian McMillan. I trawled around. I eventually found the scorecard um, of that match. It was actually South Africa versus Victoria, mm -hmm. and I was able to say um, Brian McMillan twisted his ankle in the 13th, third ball of his 13th over. But it, it took a long time, <laughs> and, and, and people, uh, Richard Snell, who played in that game, he, he was able to point me in that direction. He said, look, I can't remember when it was, but if you can find the scorecard, it'll be there. And then he gave us the quote to say it was just a mess. But I also used um, the newspaper library at uh, the Joburg Library. I wanted, I did a story on Sea Cottage being shot uh, before the Durban July 1966. But I wanted to know but how soon, well, what was the gap between the shooting and the actual race? And I knew Durban July is always first Saturday of, of July. Mm -hmm. So that was easy enough to find when was that in 66. The only way to find out when he actually got shot was to go into the newspaper library. And I trawled my way through it and found it was three weeks earlier. In fact, it was June 16, 1966. Ten years later, Soweto Uprising. <laughs> I don't know if there's a link there. I don't think so. Dave, one thing that, that struck me about the book was, um, for instance, the story about Buster Newpin. Yeah. I mean, this, this man really went through the wars and he went on to captain South Africa in, in one or, or more tests. Um, 
but those stories didn't seem to come through for the professional sportsmen. Did you find it was more interesting, the stories the older guys had oh, to yes. tell or they all invo- were all oh, involved in? No question. And, I, and I'm glad you pick on the Buster Newpin one because uh, my mate L.B. During, uh, who's a font of, of, of sporting knowledge, um, was really a great help to me. And he said, do a question about, because he's from King, King Edwards. So he said, do a, a question about uh, the boys from Kez who've captained South Africa. So it's uh, Ali Bacher, Graham Smith, there might be one other, and Buster Nupin. So then I started just looking around. So originally that was the question. Mm-hmm. And then I look at uh, looking at the story of Buster Nupin, I find that his parents were both Norwegian, and in fact his name was Olaf something else, and they changed his name. Uh, and then I found that as a little boy he was playing with a grinder or something, he got a metal splinter in his eye and he lost his eye. Mm-hmm. So he was a one-eyed Norwegian. And suddenly the question, a b- far better question was, <laughs> name the one-eyed Norwegian who captained South Africa. And then, uh, you're absolutely right, Buster Nupin, he captained South Africa in one test. He scored runs, he took wickets, he, it was it called the Nupin test, and then he was dropped. So then <laughs> lies another story. Why on earth was Buster Nupin dropped when he'd done so well? Mm-hmm. He'd won this test match. So it became a fascinating story. But you're right, the older people tended to be more colourful, uh, have more to them, and, and cricket uh, chucked up so many more questions. But, you know, I also looked at things like bowls. Uh, I remember growing up as a little boy, um, there was a, a world championship bowls here in South Africa, and South Africa won everything. So I thought, after that, were we successful at anything else? And I found the women in bowls internationally had won all sorts of titles. Mm-hmm. And I thought they were kind of unsung. And I, I once worked on the Olympic Games with a, a gymnast called Simon Hutchin. He was our expert analyst. And he told me that uh, when he was competing for South Africa at the Commonwealth Games, he did a vault, which was so unique it was named after him it's an accolade the international gymnastics federation gives a person mm-hmm. so there is a vault that you can do in competitions called the hutchin so that became a question as well so uh, all sorts of ways of finding out stuff and not just the mainstream sports there were other other sports mm-hmm. as well gymnastics is there now dave it's a sports book you 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 referenced sports articles other sports books but Tabo Mbeki is mentioned there as well yeah, that in was a, a cricket nice question well, tell, uh, tell me about that well that actually Alby Juring spotted that one for me he read Mark Gavis's book uh, on um, uh, the dream deferred and there's a story about the all powerful uh, West Indian side of the mid 60s that came out Gary Sobers um, involved in that side and they were sweeping everybody before them they won the first test by a country mile and they came up against Sussex in one of the tour matches Matches. And after the first day's play, we're sitting comfortably, and um, the uh, Tabu Mbeki and Esop Pahad were studying at Sussex University, and they invited the players to come and uh, come to a party. And they arrived, and they had a full tonk. Uh, eventually, the police were called, the Brighton police, and they had a look, and they saw these are the West Indians. Carry on, gentlemen. <laughs> So the next day, these guys had red shit bubbleuses. That was as far as the and, and uh, Mark Avissa says, and they they lost. There was the only time they lost. I then found the scorecard, uh, found that Mark Avissa had got a few little things wrong, but the essence of the story is completely correct. Um, they, as a result of the party, these guys had such horrendous hangovers. They got bowled out for 67 on the next day, and they lost the match. And it was one of I think it was four matches that they lost in the entire tour. So it was quite fun to have it there. And we had a female editor, and I said, who knew nothing about sport. And I if she would like it, we'd be okay. How's the book been received since its launch? Sold out. <laughs> do I need out. to say more? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, be, it's gone incredibly well. They were going to do a reprint at the end of July, and they've brought that forward. They've brought that forward a month. So the reprint is happening as we speak, and today is the 26th. Noting that success, a second one in the pipeline? Yeah, and we'll certainly do that. At the front of the book, there's an email address for people to send trivia. But as people get the book and chat to me, they'll say, I've got a trivia one for you. So I've already started on book number two, and I reckon we'll give it a year. I don't think we need one, another one this year. Uh, we'll have them gasping for gasping for more. And finally, Dave, you haven't only been involved in sport. You've covered a lot of politics as well, especially during the the, the turbulent apartheid years. Uh, you had experiences at the Atlanta Olympics as well. Is there another book somewhere? No, you? there's none. There's none whatsoever. And I thought about this. Everybody else has far more interesting stories. I go and ask people for stories. Nobody's. Um, I've I've had an interesting life, but there are far too many people with far more interesting lives. I'll write their stories for them. I'll write your story one day. (laughs) One day, Dave, one day. day.